the conflict in West Africa has not been terribly attentive to borders. There have been atrocities and killings in Liberia. They subsided for a while and went across the border to Sierra Leone. Even once peace came to Sierra Leone, the killing simply went back to Liberia. Charles Taylor has been one of the most prominent figures throughout this ugly period of West Africa's history. Charles Taylor came to power in order to take control of the resources of Liberia, but he didn't stop there. And the war in Liberia quickly spread over the border into Sierra Leone as a way of grabbing that country's diamond wealth. In Sierra Leone, a rebel group by the name of the Revolutionary United Front was contesting power by rampaging through the countryside, chopping off the limbs of its victims as a way of sending a message to the government of Sierra Leone that its days were numbered. Charles Taylor, both as a rebel leader and later as president of Liberia, was the primary logistical and political backer for the war in Sierra Leone, the signature atrocity of limb amputation. Um, but there were so many other um, horrific violations that happened, massacres, rape of girls and women, abduction of entire families appalling crimes, not for any practical purpose, but simply to create that absolutely naked fear. The prosecution of Charles Taylor is significant because there are very few heads of state who have been brought to justice. The status of being a sitting president is no longer an absolute bar to indictment when it comes to the mass slaughter of innocent civilians, the forced displacement of populations on the basis of their ethnicity, or the use of rape as a weapon of war intimidation. In 2003, the Special Court for Sierra Leone issued an indictment for Charles Taylor, charging him with 17 counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Not surprisingly, Taylor refused to surrender. A few months later, Nigeria offered Taylor asylum as a way to get him to step down as president. The UN, the US, and the African Union all supported his exile in Nigeria. But for activists, exile was no substitute for justice. They organized the Campaign Against Impunity to push for Taylor's transfer to the Special Court for trial. One of the key members of the campaign was Elise Kepler. Groups in West Africa expressed really intense desire to see Charles Taylor face justice. And there was a really strong feeling that there needed to be a break from the past in that region, there needed to be an end to impunity, and Charles Taylor's surrender and facing trial was a key part of that advancement. Charles Taylor is viewed as the devil that is one of those responsible for the sufferings of the people of Sierra Leone. We were working closely with a campaigner at Amnesty International who had a number of close relationships with activists on the ground in West Africa. And it was our work with that campaigner uh, where we sat down and basically strategized who are the groups in West Africa who might be working on this issue and who might want to join forces. After identifying some of those groups, we reached out. We reached out by email um, and we waited to see what came back in terms of were groups working on this? Did they want to be in coalition? And did they really want to work together in a close coordinated fashion on these issues? And we ultimately ended up with about two or three groups in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Liberia that we had kind of a core core group um, approach where we were all in contact and email. There were many, many more groups who are part of the campaign, um, and those groups um, would be I, affiliated in a way with our press releases and our statements. But in terms of deciding what strategies and when, it was the core groups that really helped define those strategies. 
Some of the initial aims of the campaign were first to make it clear why Nigeria was obligated to arrest uh, Charles Taylor and transfer him to the special court for Sierra Leone, um, and also why they should do it. What, what were the incentives or what were the reasons that this was going to be beneficial from a rule of law perspective, from a human rights perspective? Um, it was also to make clear that this was a global international human rights concern. This was not just a Western issue. Um, and then the third was also to make this an issue that wasn't going to go away. And that's something that went across the campaign for, for several years, was to really make this something that would be front and center um, for Nigeria, for Liberia, that the feeling would be that this would have to be resolved because it wasn't going to fade away from international consciousness. Press releases were a big part of the campaign, um, and we really tried to project um, both the local and international uh, activist voices in those press releases. Um, but we also tried to time our press releases uh, in ways and at events that would be relevant to the kind of public popular debate. when President Obasanjo, the president of Nigeria, was traveling to try and basically dog him with questions. If he was in a, at an event, to perhaps email journalists and say, uh, Obasanjo's going to be there. What's he doing about Taylor? Why don't you ask him? What is he doing about Taylor? At the same time, we looked at pressing the UN Security Council. We looked at pressing the European Union. We looked at pressing the US government, really um, with a triangulation effect. The idea was to have those players then raise the issue with President Obasanjo and raise the issue with President Johnson and Sirleaf. Challenges that we faced in the campaign against impunity uh, were definitely, uh, I don't know if stubbornness is the right word, uh, but definitely the resilience of the Nigerian president at the outset of not really feeling the pressure. So there we were kind of churning out press releases, strategizing, coming up with a wide array of arguments. Um, and in the early years, it just, it didn't really seem to prevail, to um, pierce, the, pierce the debate. Um, I also think there was a lot of, I don't know if the word is guilt, but a feeling on the part of the US or the UK that they just really couldn't revisit this issue because they had been involved um, in the decision for Nigeria to take Taylor in. He made clear that he would only turn Taylor over to justice if a democratically elected president of Liberia were to make the request. In late 2005, the campaign had been underway for two years when Liberia held its first democratic elections in nearly 20 years. When we realized that President Johnson Sirleaf, or that Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was gonna be elected as president of Liberia, uh, we got very excited because she was a known international figure. She was known for being um, not necessarily justice or human rights oriented, but kind of very aware of international standards in line with rule of law. And so we thought, you know, this should be a cinch. We thought she would say, I'm looking to raise this with him, you know, kind of set in motion certain pieces that would then lay the groundwork for that surrender. Um, instead, she said, uh, you know, this is not a priority. I have roads to build. I have electricity to turn on. Liberia is coming out of civil war. That was in Sierra Leone. He's in Nigeria now. Charles Taylor, we're not this is this is not a major issue for us. That was, I would say, somewhat of a setback in the campaign because we really had high hopes for Johnson Sirleaf. But it also was a clear opening for us um, where we then started to work with the Liberian groups, but also the Nigerian groups and Sierra Leonean groups to have Johnson Sirleaf realize that this was not an issue she could sideline. In working in coalitions between local and international groups, and over the years I've been in quite a few of those coalitions, um, it's become clear to me that often we're in a situation where international groups, Human Rights Watch and others like Amnesty International, can often bring certain pieces to the work that local groups um, have less experience with or less expertise with, while local groups can often bring other assets that uh, our groups would not, would not be able to bring to the table. Local groups kept the issue alive in Liberia and Nigeria, 
In Liberia, they sent letters to government officials. They used talk shows across the country to raise the issue. They organized marches in Liberia's capital. In Nigeria, campaign members printed 10,000 posters with the slogan, Charles Taylor Wanted. I've also found that a lot of times um, local groups are able to bring a sense of um, timing to the unfolding debates locally and pressure points, what the pressure points should be. For example, around Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and knowing when that first press conference was going to happen when John Johnson Sirleaf came to power, understanding who would be the journalist locally who would be able to raise the issue. Um, that is not something you know we would have been aware of. On the other hand, Human Rights Watch could come in and say, we know the UN Security Council discussion is going to be on X date. So we had more of a sense of the international calendar. But I certainly think that the relationship between the international groups and the local groups, we each gave value to the other, and I think the sum was greater than the parts, for sure. So for me, I mean, I think one of the greatest moments of my career as an activist was getting to the point where Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was at the UN Security Council and was briefing journalists uh, about Liberia and the meetings there, and she indicated that she was, in fact, going to request Charles Taylor's surrender from Nigeria because, in fact, Liberia could no longer move forward with its essential business unless she dealt with that issue. I've just said, we've said to President Obasanjo, it's time to bring the, closure, the Taylor issue to closure. When Obasanjo finally understood that he would have to surrender Taylor, he began to play games. He made an announcement saying, I'm not Charles Taylor's custodian. I'm not his jailer. Come and get him. It sounded great in principle, but in reality, it was an invitation to Taylor to flee. You didn't need to be um, with Scotland Yard or Interpol to understand that Charles Taylor was going to take that as a signal to get the hell out of town, which he did. President Obasanjo was scheduled to meet with President Bush, and there was a lot of outrage in the U.S. Congress uh, on the fact that Taylor had disappeared. And Human Rights Watch helped convince the Bush administration to make clear that Obasanjo was not going to get to meet with President Bush without actually surrendering Taylor to justice. And at that stage, Taylor was, in fact, handed over to the special court. I think it would be hard to overstate the significance of Charles Taylor's conviction um, for crimes in Sierra Leone for the whole subregion in West Africa. I mean, really, people looked at Charles Taylor as an untouchable, a big man in Africa. And the idea that someone at the highest echelons of power could be brought into the dock, could face trial, could be convicted, and is now serving essentially a life sentence changes forever the landscape in West Africa about what's possible. And I'll never forget with Charles Taylor, I mean, people just couldn't believe that this was happening. Um, you know, we got, we were in touch with people who had worked on this campaign in uh, Freetown and people just reported that there was cheering from the rooftops as he was flown in on a helicopter into Freetown, cheering from the rooftops, just such excitement that, wow, this could really happen.